the N64, Nintendo's super-powered 64-bit super console, built in partnership with CGI pioneers Silicon Graphics. That's the official story anyway. Or is it some exotic alien technological artefact that they found buried under some ancient shrine? We may never know the full truth, but let me ask you, does this really look like a controller built for human hands? Whatever its true origins, I'm going to take a look at some of the games that pushed it to the limits, starting with Beetle Adventure Racing. Not that kind of Beetle, sadly, or even this kind, but the Volkswagen variety. Minor disappointments aside, this looks really good and it's quite fun to play too, but how does this game push the limits? That's what I like to do in these videos, try to drill down into the details of game systems and what they can do. And in this case, just the fact that this is a realistic racing game is a very good start. Or at least relatively realistic, it's not a sim, but it does feature real vehicles in realistic locations. And it's not guaranteed that the N64 should be good at this sort of thing. But hold on, if the PlayStation can do Gran Turismo, surely the more powerful N64 should be able to eat this stuff for breakfast though. Well, not necessarily, because the N64 has one massive weakness that puts limits on what it can do, and it's probably not the limitation that you're thinking of. I'm not talking about storage space here, old school cartridge versus the huge capacity of CD-ROMs, although of course that is important. No, there's something more fundamental to the N64 graphics that causes problems. It's 4 kilobyte texture cache. What on earth is this? Well, let me start by saying that the N64 is good with 3D graphics. It's good at drawing polygons, the 2D shapes, usually triangles, that make up 3D models that 3D graphics are constructed out of. It can draw more of them per second more accurately than the rival PlayStation and certainly anything else that came before it. It's also pretty good at filling these triangles in, giving the models substance. That's the other big part of 3D graphics. Again, it can do this better than the competition. So what's the problem? Well, it's what it fills those triangles with. That's where the issue lies. The polygons of 3D models are filled with 2D images known as textures. And at any given moment, the N64 only has 4 kilobytes of textures to work with. That's not the limit for the whole game or even the whole screen. It's not quite that bad. But when it's filling triangles, it can only fill them with 4 kilobyte chunks of texture. Which means that the absolute most, your texture can't be any bigger than 128 by 64 pixels. And in reality, it's often going to be less than that. There are things that can be done to mitigate this. You can swap textures in and out very quickly to fill the screen with a whole bunch of differently textured stuff, but this takes time and resources, and it's always a limitation. This means that any kind of high-resolution, detailed textures are very difficult on the N64, if not impossible, and this fact explains a lot of why N64 graphics look like N64 graphics. So, Beetle Adventure Racing does well to create a realistic-looking world with this texture limitation. One trick that the N64 does have with textures is filtering. It can take a low resolution texture and smooth it out, taking it from being blocky to a more pleasing blur. This is particularly handy for drawing naturalistic textures, rocks, grass, road surfaces, that sort of thing. Anything without clearly defined features looks good with these filtered textures. Other stuff, especially man-made objects, tend to look a bit flat and generic without the fine details, particularly when you get up close. Still, it's not bad even if this world isn't quite as authentic in its attention to detail as something you might see in a PlayStation game. Yes, it's weird, but the road signs and corporate logos of a game like Ridge Racer Type 4 are things that the N64 struggles with. The PlayStation, despite other limitations, having much more memory for textures available in practice. There are other ways, though, that this game makes up for this lack of texture detail by 
Adding other details, one of them being the reflections in the cars, a form of environment mapping. If you look closely, you can see what appears to be quite realistic reflections of the world around your car in the paintwork. You might remember the metal cap from Mario 64, that was something similar, but there the image reflected in Mario's body was this weird generic garden scene. It looks pretty cool, but not a real reflection of the world around the character. In Beetle Racing though, it really is a reflection of sorts, it doesn't truly match up with real geometry, the rear of the car seems to be reflecting stuff in front of it, like these balloons at the start of this course. It looks pretty good though, and is more realistic than many other attempts at this sort of thing from this era. How does this work? Well, I honestly don't know for certain, but I can guess and say that it's using a frame buffer as a texture. Basically, it's taking part of the screen and applying it as a semi-transparent texture to the car's bodywork. The Jumbotron video screen in Mario 64 does something similar, taking the main view and drawing it on the big screen as a texture. This, I think, is similar, but more impressive. It's updated faster for a start, the motion is smooth and it's fitted to the shape of the car. How does this work with the 4 kilobyte texture limitation? Well, I don't know, but the reflection is probably not that high resolution and it's probably split up into chunks too. However it works though, it looks great and there are many other great effects here too. In fact, it seems like the developers Paradigm Entertainment really went to town here and turned this into a showcase of N64 graphics trickery with particle effects, motion blur, fog and all that late 90s state of the art stuff. Particularly impressive are the real time shadows which are brilliantly shown off in this tunnel. Instead of having just one fixed shadow for the cars, in some games it's just part of the models, they actually here move and change shape realistically. In the tunnel it doesn't quite match up with the lights shown on the walls, but it still looks pretty realistic as you move past the light sources and the shadows cast by the car change. The kind of thing you probably would never notice by itself just playing casually, but it does subtly add to the believability of the whole scene. Beetle Adventure Racing is an enjoyable game that really looks superb for something that came out in the last millennium. It's even got very solid frame rates, never dipping below 30, though it doesn't hit that magic 60 either. This next game does do that though, but before I get to that, here's a word from today's sponsor, Brilliant. What is brilliant? Well, it's interactive learning, the best way to learn science, math and computer science. It's got thousands of lessons with new stuff being added all the time across those fundamental STEM subjects. I know just about enough computer science to tell you that the courses in this area definitely are really good college level stuff available to anyone and everyone and that's got to be a good thing, hasn't it? Me, well, my science knowledge does need a brush up, just out of personal interest. I love Nile Red, Veritasium, you know, all those guys, but it has made me realise I am missing out on some core fundamentals of science and the maths that goes with it. But just spending 30 minutes a day and it's amazing how much I've learned. And you can too if you want to level up, whether it's for a career boost or just for fun, you can do it here and not just gain knowledge, but learn how to be a better thinker. To get started for free, head to brilliant.org forward slash Shiropolis or click the link in the description. The first 200 people will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. So thank you, Brilliant. OK, we're back and it's F-Zero, one of the very few N64 games that are steady as a rock at 60 frames per second on an NTSC console. High frame rates were not something that developers prioritised above other things most of the time, not Nintendo and not Rare either, the other big hitters on the N64. Nintendo here knew though just how important smooth action would be for this game and so it's got that in spades. In fact, it's so smooth it stands out against nearly any other 3D game on a home system in this era. Sometimes people make too much out of frame rates, but higher is always better and it does make a difference to this sort of immensely fast paced game. It really does run amazingly well whilst still looking good and with a fantastic soundtrack too. 
Yes, it's a great game, but no surprises. Nintendo first-party stuff rarely dips below the amazing, does it? And I usually avoid these games in these videos, because you've already seen them, haven't you? You don't need more about the Ocarina of Time or whatever. But this is a bit different, I'll make an exception just because of its performance. So, how did Nintendo do it? How did they keep the frame rate up when others couldn't? Well, they kept it simple. Now, there's no doubt that the N64 could definitely throw around more polygons than the console competition. It had more juice in that regard than the PS1 or the Saturn, but it was not massively more powerful. Comparing like for like with texture mapped polygons, blighting effects and all that, the N64 could do more, but not loads more. No one seems to know exact numbers, but 160,000 polygons per second is what I've seen quoted. That works out at 2,666 polygons per frame, more or less, if you're running at 60 frames per second. Two and a half thousand-ish polygons is all you're going to have to draw your 3D models if you want to keep up that frame rate. If you make the scene any more complicated, it's going to take longer to draw and your frame rate will go down. If we have a look at this game running in wireframe mode with all the textures stripped away, we can see that the geometry is kept to a minimum of complexity. There's the track, there's the cars, but not a whole lot else, not anywhere in the game. Nintendo kept the frame rate up by making sure the N64 didn't have much work to do. We can compare this with Wipeout 64, a similar sort of game which runs at 30 frames per second. Looking at this in wireframe mode, we can see just how much more complex the scene is. There's loads more polygons, no surprise then that this game ran at a lower frame rate. There's just more stuff to draw. So even though the N64 was more powerful than other machines in terms of geometry, it still had to cut back to keep things moving. Though, looking at it, it hardly seems that there's anything missing in this game and the simplicity of the graphics come across as a stylistic choice rather than something dictated by the technology, but Nintendo were always masters at that. So moving on, what's next? Well, I can't do this video without mentioning Factor 5. They did three games on the N64 and they all look absolutely amazing. This is Rogue Squadron, which came out in 1998, drippingly fabulous all over with some great lighting effects. It also makes use of the N64 expansion pack to run in a higher resolution mode. I say higher, it's not the full resolution the N64 allowed, but I don't think any game actually used that for anything other than static screens. Instead, it runs at 400 by 440, still a bit of a step up from the 320 by 240 that most N64 games run in. And yes, all the footage you'll see of games in this video is at the original resolution. A lot, a lot of the N64 game footage you'll see on YouTube has been upscaled in some way, which I can definitely understand the appeal of, but it's, well, it kind of defeats the object in a limit-pushing video like this. Factor 5 managed to outdo themselves, though, with Star Wars Episode 1, the Battle for Naboo, which came out in 2000, and it improves on the formula graphically in every way. Yeah, the title's a bit unwieldy, but it's got a whole new game engine with still the high-res mode, but even more lighting effects, and manages to increase the draw distance, getting rid of most of the fog. It's even more drippingly fabulous from start to finish and still runs at a solid 30 frames per second. But surely though, the most impressive of the Factor 5 N64 Trinity has to be Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine. This has it all, an unwieldy title, very dense high polygon environments, superb lighting and shadow effects, great character animation, brilliant sound, and it's all still in a higher resolution mode and maintains 30 frames per second once again. Harrison Ford must have been busy because it's not his voice in this game and the guy they got in to replace him does sound more like Leslie Nielsen, but well... <laughs> I think that would have been a better casting choice from the start anyway. Funny how I didn't spot this before. If this is the prize, I'll lose my grant for sure. Where are the priceless artifacts? The gilded idols? The crowns of kings? 
But overall, this is an N64 game with everything just turned up a notch. The kind of things you've seen in third-person action games like Zelda, but just done that bit better. Well, graphically anyway, and apparently Factor 5 achieved a lot of these improvements through custom microcode for the Reality Signal processor, the part of the N64 that deals with geometry, lighting, clipping and all that kind of stuff. A very specialised processor that could be reprogrammed to alter the way it worked, allowing for developers to choose between different versions of the software for it that focus on different things. Most developers just stuck with the microcode that Nintendo had supplies, selecting if they wanted to use the fast 3D code or the more accurate one, or if they wanted to use the one focused on 2D graphics. Though not many developers, it seems, took that last option, and actually writing your own microcode is quite difficult, especially as Nintendo seemed pretty tight-lipped about how it all worked, but, well, Factor 5 were one of the few that rose to the challenge and persevered with it. What does this mean in practice? Well, apart from improved performance, more complex scenes at higher resolutions, it also allowed for better lighting effects for one thing. Here in this scene in the opening of level 6, there are 12 different light sources at once. This is quite a lot. The PS1 and Saturn could have just three light sources each, and normally the N64 could have just seven. And if you wander around here, it's amazing to see the way all the lighting interacts. You can even see the different sources casting different shadows on the feet of Indy. The next level, the Palawan Temple, has dynamic light sources too. These lava bubbles illuminating Indy as they pop up. Really nicely done. When lava pours out near the sea surface, tremendous volcanic explosions sometimes occur. Lighting effects on the N64 and other consoles of the same generation worked by adding a colour gradient to the surfaces they illuminate, giving a realistic looking shading. Quite often games, especially on the PlayStation, faked this with what's called baked-in lighting. Textures were drawn to look shaded rather than done with actual complex active lighting effects to make things easier and less taxing on the system. N64 games do this a bit, but the 4K texture limit comes into play here. There's not enough space to fit more textures on top of what you already have. But when you have the advanced lighting capabilities of the N64, it's actually easier to do these effects for real than to try and fake them, something that Indiana Jones makes great use of. The Minister hereby reminds Comrade Dr. Valodnikov that socialist theory disavows the existence of supernatural power. So, what's next on the list? Where can we go from here? Well, this next one, it may not be a big surprise to see it here. It's been called the most impressive console port of all time. It's Resident Evil 2. The second in the series and the only one on the N64, but was then and still is a big surprise to see on the N64. Why is it so impressive? Why might it be the best console port of all time? Well, storage space, of course, that's the issue. CD-ROMs on the PlayStation and Sega Saturn had a capacity of well over 600 megabytes, and of course, quite a few games would appear on multiple discs. It's not unusual for games on either of these platforms to be north of a gigabyte. N64 cartridges on the other hand, well, these maxed out at a modest 64 megabytes at the absolute most, and that includes Resident Evil 2. That's as big as games could ever get, so how on earth can you fit what was a two-disc game with loads of video and audio into a 64 megabyte cartridge? Well, data compression, and lots of it, is the answer. Comparing the two versions side by side, the PlayStation's cutscenes do look a bit better, but not that much. They are a bit sharper, with a few less artefacts and what looks like better colour reproduction too, but that's all there is to show for the extra capacity. People said the N64 couldn't do full motion video like this, but clearly it can with some work. It lacked the hardware video decoding that was built into the PlayStation, but it did have a powerful enough CPU and graphics coprocessor that it could be done in software. 
Still, it is a massively impressive achievement that coder Todd Maynink managed to create the compression that fit the full 15 minutes of video this game has into that 64 meg cart along with all the rest of the stuff too. Outside of the cutscenes, it's equally impressive. The backgrounds may be a bit downgraded compared to the PS1 original, but again, not that much. The music on the N64 is reputedly higher quality than the PlayStation version 2, though the voice acting isn't sounding a bit less sharp. I haven't played very far into this game, I will admit, but from what I can gather, there's nothing missing from the two-disc PS1 original. In fact, there's apparently even some extra content. Yeah, that really isn't a bad achievement. 1.2 gigabytes more or less squeezed down to fit into 64 megabytes. It really is quite stunning to see this running, and even when the N64 isn't playing to its strengths, it can still come up with the goods. Right then, time marches on, and I think it's probably time for the final act, and probably time to talk about Rare. And they were really the masters of the N64, they probably had a better grip on it than even Nintendo did, and well, if we're going to be talking about Rare, I think it's got to be Perfect Dark. I could easily have made this whole video featuring just rare games. Everything they did on the N64 pushed it to the limits, and every one is definitely a classic. Uh, okay, maybe not Mickey Speedway, but the rest of them are all really good. I mean, it's not terrible, isn't Mickey Speedway? But anyway, per Perfect Dark, I would though say, takes the crown as the best rare N64 game, and maybe just flat out the best looking N64 game of them all. And yes, it plays pretty well too, the spiritual successor to GoldenEye, but not nearly as well remembered, which is a shame because it is a fantastic game in every way that supersedes what came before it. To be absolutely fair, you could maybe argue that it's not quite as technically advanced as Factor 5 games. Maybe it's lower resolution and got a lower frame rate most of the time. There is a high res mode you can select, but it does cause a big dip in that frame rate. In other aspects, though, it definitely brings the good and has just gallons of graphical flair. Maybe comes out looking better, even if it doesn't perform quite as well. It makes brilliant use of limited textures. I love these abstract paintings on the wall of the main hub, the Carrington Institute. It is, of course, a low-res image, but enlarged and filtered with the N64 texture filtering. It looks surprisingly authentic, especially with the shadows over the top of it seemingly cast by the windows. Another filtered low-res texture, I think, laid over the top of everything else. I love these wall carvings in the first level too, lit from a low level. Again, a low-res texture filtered, but they look like the kind of high-end wall art you'd get in a corporate office. Rare were absolute masters of stretching the limited textures available, recolouring them, layering them, rotating them, giving them as much variety as possible, making for a world that looks a lot less bland, generic or overly cartoony like a lot of games on this system. But the list of delicious effects goes on, including the volumetric lighting effect of these giant fans. This is nothing like as sophisticated as what modern GPUs can do in this respect, but it is a nice touch. If we take a peek at this in wireframe mode, we can just see the polygons that make up the lighting volumes. These are just semi-transparent shapes rendered on the scene. I'm pretty sure modern volumetric lighting is done in a different way. This corona effect is interesting too. Again, I'm really not sure how this works, but a lot of emulators don't emulate this correctly. If we look at it in wireframe mode, we can see that this isn't polygons. It's something to do with the depth buffer, but other than that, I don't know. You can even turn out the lights completely in this section, leaving the room in total darkness, apart from the muzzle flash of your gun and the occasional flashes of broken lights if you've shot them out. Amazing attention to detail. There's also the reflective floor too in the main hub, another marvel. You can see the furniture and everything, but this one is pretty easy to explain. 
Looking at this in wireframe mode, we can see that the reflected objects are just the things on the floor turned upside down with a transparent layer on top of them. No fancy frame buffer work here, but the fact that the N64 can draw enough polygons to get away with this sort of thing. A few other games did do something similar on the N64. I think the, the World Is Not Enough is another one that does it, but I don't remember seeing anything like this on the PlayStation. So that's perfect dark. I've barely started the first level and there's already been so much to talk about. It carries on at about the same pace from there, really, and if you've never played this game, well, you owe it to yourself to give it a go. And time marches on, so I think this will be the end of our tour around N64 town for now. I had a great time with this. All of these games really stand up well in the gameplay department. Are there any that I've missed out? Well, I'm sure you'll have some ideas. Let me know in the comments. And if you haven't already, now would be a great time to subscribe and maybe even hit that like button too. Thank you once again to my generous patrons on Patreon. Your help really does make a difference. And if you too would like to join them, there is a link below. So I will sign off for now and say thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.